So I'm going to talk to you today about random and fixed effects. I've kind of referred to random effects within uh, nested models, and now I want to develop those ideas a little bit. And I'm kind of excited about this topic because um, the appreciation of it really kind of came to me um, first from a student of mine who is pictured right below me here. Um, this is Cindy Bennington, who is now a professor at Stetson University in Florida. And um, in an article by Bennington and Fain, written, I believe, in 1994, um, Cindy and a uh, statistics prof here uh, reviewed some of the ecological literature about the use that ecologists were making of random and fixed effects and found, in fact, that um, there were actually very few, um, well, not very few, but a low percentage of studies could actually, um, you could tell whether they were designating factors as random or fixed effects. And then even if they did tell, it was sometimes not possible to judge the model. And then there were cases where people actually revealed what they did in terms of their stats and they turned out to have done it wrong. So it was a revealing study. In fact, it's been because it's a, an evaluation of methods and people like to um, cite those kinds of papers. It's been cited over 150 times as of the making of this video. So it turned out to be an important topic to review. And I'm proud that one of my students did it. She didn't like having her picture shown. So I just decided to show it because it'll embarrass her. So anyway, um, we're going to talk about fixed and random effects. So what am I talking about when I'm talking about fixed effects? Let's start with that. So fixed effects. Fixed effects are factors whose levels are chosen by the investigator, by the experimenter. Factors whose levels are specifically chosen by the investigator. Okay, so uh, what does that mean? Well, that means that they have chosen those levels and, first of all, uh, each level that has been chosen is of interest. So, for example, if one sets up an experiment with low, medium, and high nitrogen levels, one actually cares about the performance of the organism in response to low, medium, and high nitrogen. And likewise, all levels of, say, a pharmacological uh, treatment, one would be interested in all of those levels. If you're not interested, why would you choose those levels? Now, I'll explain how that differs from other kinds of effects. Um, uh, in a, in a moment, but just understand that uh, with fixed effects, we are interested in the means we are getting out of each level. And um, we could, if we repeated this experiment, we could choose those same levels again. Um, there is no intention of extrapolating to other levels. So when we get a mean, we aren't saying that that mean applies to other levels. And this is why ANOVA results are kind of preferentially plotted uh, as bars like this, for example, for a two-way ANOVA. We have two factors um, plotted versus our Y. Okay, so we often will plot something like this because we don't want to falsely imply as a graph like this would, for example, that we know something about the values in between. So if we went to low from low to high nitrogen and uh, we drew these lines, it would kind of indicate that we know something about the values of our y between, but we don't actually, we haven't measured it. And that's why histograms are often favored as um, ways of depicting ANOVA results. Okay, and then finally, um, the same, same, same levels could be used again by someone else or by, by you, the investigator.
okay? So they're chosen for a reason. Each level is of interest. There's no intention of extrapolating to other levels, and the same levels could be used again. And those are the characteristics of fixed effects. And by the way, when we were doing most of our ANOVAs um, uh, so far with our factorial experiments, most of our factors have been fixed effects. So let's talk about some examples of fixed effect that are typical uh, in biology. I'm going to focus on biology here, even though the principle of fixed and random effects applies to many different fields. So for example, um, species is very typically a, um, a fixed effect in a model. Uh, temperature. We would set temperatures that we are interested in learning the response of organisms to. We wouldn't set sort of random temperatures. Um, diet. We'll give discrete diets that actually mean something uh, and that we can make inferences about. Um, drug concentration, for example, um, or even the type of drug. So we might have three different drugs that we're comparing. Um, water. Uh, treatment, uh, light level, nutrients. Now these can be sort of continuous variables that um, that we may want to analyze with a different approach altogether. Um, if we are interested in values that are sort of continuous, we may want to uh, vary these things in a continuous fashion and perform a regression, right? If we have a continuous x and a continuous y, that yields regression. So. But if we were doing an ANOVA, if we were doing distinct water, light, and nutrient treatments, then we might want to um, uh, just have discrete levels. In fact, treatments generally that we are imposing are typically fixed effects of, of almost any, anything you can imagine manipulating. You know, drought level, all kinds of things. I'm just listing some fairly typical ones here for fixed effects. All right, so if that's a fixed effect, what is a random effect? So a random effect, um, in a random effect, the levels of the independent variable are not specifically chosen. But the independent variable, the x, right? They are not specifically chosen. Oops. Okay. But instead are drawn randomly. From a larger population of such levels. or possible levels. Okay, so um, in this case, because you're randomly sampling, presumably you're sampling from a larger distribution and you actually do wish to make inferences. So you do wish to make inferences about the larger population of such levels that are possible. Okay. And second, if the experiment was repeated, you would actually choose, by random chance, different levels. So if repeated, um, you would uh, have different levels. Uh, the next time. Okay, so um, why would you ever do this? Well, if you want to extrapolate to a more general group, you would want to do this. All right, so for example, let's, let's give some biological examples. Again, okay, so um, I'm sorry if you're hearing some screaming in the background. There's a party out on the green space outside my office, so uh, makes it always entertaining. 
Um, anyway, um, some examples would be, uh, for example, family. So if we cho randomly chose families to look at, or if we randomly chose particular genotypes, uh, although genotype could actually be uh, either fixed or random, depending upon how we define genotype. But if we're really just talking about individual there, then um, in fact, we can put individual in that category. If we randomly choose individuals to be part of a group, that could be a, a, a random effect. Maybe we make multiple measurements on it, but um, maybe a particular mountain. So we have a mountain range and we can randomly choose five mountains that we're doing a, a gradient on or something. Um, lake, pond, so repeatable units that we might sample from, stream. Okay, and we want to extrapolate to all streams. Watershed, and we want to extrapolate to all watersheds, not talk about those specific ones. And in fact, plots and blocks generally that we randomly place spatially, um, and, and this applies to if they are randomly placed. Those would be considered random effects. And in fact, at every level, we need to be randomly selecting these for them to be considered random effects. So um, in every case, we are not interested in these particular lakes, ponds, streams, watersheds, etc. We are interested in lakes generally, or mountains generally, or individuals generally, from a larger population of ones that we could have studied. Okay, so those would be considered random effects. And what we're going to find is that random effects are tested slightly differently, so that we actually can make that generalization, whereas fixed effects, we have a more restricted test that we're going to do for our f-test. Okay, there are, uh, in fact, a few variables that could be either. So examples of variables that might be random or fixed, depending upon uh, various things, um, depending upon how they were selected, and depending upon the desired inferences that one wishes to make. In other words, just those groups, or were they, or are you trying to make inferences beyond that particular group? So, examples. Um, population. You might be interested in a particular population or a set of populations, um, and you want to talk about those, or you might be interested in extrapolating to all populations. Uh, in fact, in general, um, groupings that are sort of genetic groupings, ecotype, variety, subspecies, sometimes you will be interested in those specific entities just like you are with species, but sometimes you'll just be interested in group-to-group -group variation within um, a species. And then you might randomly choose ecotypes, varieties, or subspecies. So um, year. Um, again, you don't really choose years, but you might have a population of years, and if you think they are representative of a larger group, you could treat it as random, but you might also treat it as fixed. Blocks. Now, so you might be surprised at this one because we've talked about randomly locating blocks, and if we do, um, usually they're random. If so, that these are randomly placed as representative of a larger area, we would treat blocks as random. But occasionally we place blocks non randomly. So, for example, we might have uh, a greenhouse here and we put blocks, maybe we have greenhouse tables, you know, and we've put an experiment on each table, we got every factor confounded with every block, um, and, and so block is representing place within the greenhouse, and we can't really randomize it because there's not enough space in the greenhouse. So these are specific blocks, like this block is over in this corner on the left side of the greenhouse, and this block is in the center, and it's never going to be anywhere else, and it's not randomly placed. Then we might be able to treat as block as a fixed effect and still out, pull out that spatial variation. Um, you know, 
in fact, environment units generally could be either fixed or random depending on how they were chosen and the desired inferences that you would like to make. All right, so I've kind of hinted to you that random and fixed effects are going to have a different role in our statistical models, and they will. And the other thing I want to point out is that random effects are nested effects. In other words, effects that are nested within some other factor, these are always random. And so if they aren't, um, you can't actually treat them as a nested effect. So because they have to be representative of the units below our particular unit um, in order to uh, be considered a, a replicate. Um, so for example, just going back to our nested design with flasks, if we have a, a low nitrogen treatment and a high nitrogen treatment, then if we have three flasks in each treatment, these are considered random flasks, okay? And they would have to be randomly placed on a bench and perhaps even rotated around so they weren't acquiring characteristics of a particular place, um, but they would be random and the variation between them would be representative of, representative of flasks that contain low nitrogen. And these three would be representative of a larger population of possible flasks that contain high nitrogen. So um, they are considered random effects, just like any kind of environmental unit. Okay, um, so those are random and fixed effects. And as I say, we're going to actually specify in SAS jump models when we have a random and fixed effects. For example, if we have... Um, a case where we have, let's say, uh, a shade treatment. And we uh, have a block that's randomly located um, in which some of these blocks get shade and some don't get shade. Uh, block is going to be a random effect. Okay, um, so and in fact, block could be nested within shading treatment, depending on how I do it. So if I lay out, for example, uh, five or let's say six random blocks, and I randomly assign shade to three of those blocks, then I would have shade as an effect and block within shade as a random effect within that. And we will actually tell jump when block is random and when it is not. Okay, It will actually do then the appropriate test. It will test the shading effect over the block within shade interaction and it will test the block uh, over the error term. But well, again, we'll talk about specific models and what, it, what the random versus fixed does to that in the future. I just wanted to illustrate what fixed and random effects are and the fact that it's important that you know what they are because you're going to tell jump and it's actually going to change the nature of the test. All right.